All right, let's get into this bad boy and let's have a good time with it. Cree Gat Bundle. Welcome back to the library. Welcome to the channel, everybody. I've got the artificial 3000 watt bulb on over there because it is a crazy cloudy rainy day out there. And today's really the only day I have to shoot this because we're heading into the Niagara Comic Con weekend here. So things are gonna get a little hectic. In the meantime though, I thought it was important to dive into this topic. Now, we're going back to old school on the channel today. We're going back to what we talk about here the most and that is Conan the Barbarian, okay? Now you already saw the thumbnail, yeah. Clicked on it way back there. And that's what brought you to here. Because today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Marvel Magazine adaptation of that classic 1982 movie of Conan the Barbarian. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn the camera around here. We're going to go back to what we used to do here. We're going to actually put the camera facing down on the book. And we're going to start thumbing through it. Because I want to show you guys what's within this. Because many of us probably have never really seen this thing before. So spoiler alert right now. If you don't want to know what's in this thing... Stop watching the video. If you've clicked on it, it's got you to here, though. My assumption is you probably do want to see what's inside this, because i got to tell you, it's, it's, it's pretty darn cool. Pretty cool indeed. So, without any further ado, let's flip the camera around, because I want to make this quick. We're just going to dive into the magazine. We'll talk about some of the really cool things that are within here, and then we'll come back at the end of the video. We'll ask that bajillion-dollar question. Tennessee fans, should I go buy this? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that then. Let's get into the book. All right, let's get into the magazine, shall we? That's it. It's a pretty cool one, I gotta tell you. My copy, not so good. And what's really cool about this and what I actually like about this copy is the fact that it is not so good. What I like about this is this is a reader copy. I can pick this up and I can read it and I can toss it around and I don't feel bad about it at all because this is already, quite frankly put, had the majority of the damage it can do already done to it. I love this part over here. What you're seeing here is an ink transfer. Let me show you why, watch this. Note my hand position. See that? See it over there? See that right there? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And ink transfer. So when this magazine was sitting there being read by somebody years ago, probably in the back of a van, probably a short van, with a teardrop window in the back, I imagine there was probably heavy metal music playing. Somebody was sitting on the floor cross-legged. Probably had long hair and a mustache. And this is what they were reading. That's exactly what happened. Just like this. And the ink transferred onto their hand. Kind of cool. The other thing that's kind of neat about this is the stables are already loose. They're still attached, but you can see that middle stable there. See this? This is me pushing the back cover around a bit. It's loose. So it gives you the opportunity to get something that you're going to read. So I actually did read this. Now there are some key things within this that I wanted to point out to you guys. Now, I'm not going to go through this thing page by page, but I am going to surprise you with a couple of things that I found in here right off the bat. And then we'll do some summaries. If you really want to go through this thing page by page, make a comment down below, let me know. Maybe we'll do a different video where we actually do that. Oh, another thing right now, before we even get started. Marvel Super Special Edition, that actually is the title of this book. Marvel Super Special Edition number 21. However, if you were to go out and try to find this out in the wild in the Marvel Super Special Edition, some places are going to have it under that, other places are not. And the reason why you might misfind it is because of this. This is the giant edition of the Orwell Street Price Guide. I actually grabbed my latest copy, oh, not the latest copy, that's the giant one that I have from uh, 2013. So this is already 11 years old. It was up on the shelf, so I just grabbed it. You'll see that the actual title this goes under in here is Marvel Comics Super Special. And number 21 is right down here, and there it is right there. It's the movie adaptation of Conan. I don't know why Orwell Street made this Marvel Comics Super Special, but it might make it an issue when you're out there shopping. So if you are looking for it, make sure to look for it under both of those titles, okay? What do you get in this book? Well, I'll tell you, you get a couple of things. And, and uh, let's start off with this really good. The first thing you're gonna get in this book is, well, quite frankly put, you're going to get color. Look at that. Unlike another Conan magazine, this is a Marvel Super Special Edition. It's not just a Savage Sword. Savage Sword had cheaper quality paper, it was black and white, and that's all you got. This is a giant color extravaganza. This is a good quality stock. It's all color all throughout. And it's really well presented. Now, the reason why this is really well presented in all color is because of this. See these right here? Pictures from the movie. They didn't want to downplay this movie. Marvel was, it's in their best interest to have this movie go well as well. So if you can show this in a way that's attractive, that's a, a popping to the eye, this is a great way to do it. And quite frankly, put this worked well. So what do you get in this? Well, you get the illustrated story, which is the comic adaptation of the novelization of the movie. <laughs> you see what I did there? I didn't say it was the comic adaptation of the movie. 
So it was a comic adaptation of the novelization of the movie. And I'll, I'll get to why in a second. Then you get a series of interviews and essays. Now, these were kind of fun, because there's two different types of things that come out of this written word at the back here. One is the behind-the-camera view, and the other one is the in-front-of-the-camera view. So you get the movie, you get interviews with the people behind the scenes, and then you get interviews with the people in front of the scenes. That's a neat little put-together here, and it gives you a real holistic picture of the story, and that's kind of cool. All right, let's start with the actual novelization, or sorry, the comic version of the novelization here. We're going to turn the page, we're going to jump right into it. So now, what you're seeing here right off the bat is something that's going to set the tone for the rest of the story. This is John Buscema art throughout, but it's painted and colored in this weird way. It's not like what you typically see with a comic. When you typically are looking at a comic, the colorization is done in a certain way. In this, it almost looks like it's a watercolor. And that tone carries throughout the whole story. Now, what I will say is this. I called this the comic adaptation of the novelization for a reason. Now, here's an example of why that's the case. This is the opening scene of the comic. Well, you remember in the movie, Conan does start as a child in his village, and he's having a conversation with his father, he's making a sword, and yeah, yeah, the whole thing's going well, right? Well, within a page, everybody's dead. Not even within a page, literally within doo -doo -doo -doo, four panels, everybody's dead. The attack on his village, which was a substantial portion of the actual story, is gone. That's material. Now, I'm not saying that's because the novel made it very quick. Obviously, the comic that we're looking at here is attempting to shorten the story down to make it relatable in as few pages as possible. They got a lot of essay stuff in the back they got to get to, and this is wasting time. But what they do have to do, though, is build in the details that the novel includes to carry the story forward. Because once you're cutting too much out of the movie, where they already did too little talking to begin with at the beginning, you aren't able to follow it. So you get the wonderful editorial boxes that carry through here. And when you read these editorial boxes, these draw back to the novelization. They don't always draw back to the movie. Now, I'm saying that very blocky because I want to be very clear with this. When they're talking about the fact that it was a Vanier raid, when they're talking about that he was carried into a tribe with the Vanier men to the Wheel of Pain, all of that stuff in the novel, skimmed over in the movie, in the novel. It's clearly there. And that's why this is really what I would say is the comic adaptation of the novel, not necessarily the movie. If you're looking for comic adaptation of the movie, I imagine you're probably getting a closer version of that in the actual Marvel comics of the initial movie of Conan Barbarian. But we'll, we'll deal with that on a later date. I know there was the one for The Destroyer. I still haven't gone through or found a copy of the one that's the actual Barbarian. I assume it exists. But I would assume that's where you're going to be getting a closer version of that story. Now, there's a lot in here I could nitpick and go through it. I think that would just be rude, and I'll quite frankly put, I don't think it would be doing this justice. This is a very good story. I want to be very clear with that. If you think I'm discounting this because I'm saying it's a comic adaptation of the novel, I am not. What I'm just doing is drawing a distinction between the two. The art in here is beautiful with the watercolor. It really does go well with the tone. The other things that are in here is because they are just going with the actual book, and they're working on what's within the book. Things within the book that are beautifully drawn out and that were kind of skimmed in the movie are really brought to your attention here. And I do like the way they did that. The whole thing with Valeria coming out. The fact that actually it's quite of interesting in here is that they'd heard of her and they asked where the rest of her pirates were. And she made a comment to the fact that they were all cowards and were too scared of the, of the snake goth to pull off this heist. Really interesting details that added to the story that were in the novel. And again, there's a lot of things that I'm sure somebody will point out and say, well, I hold on to you guys. That particular reference was also in the movie. Well, you know, yeah, I'm sure there was. There's a reason why it's called the novelization. It built on it, though, and added more. Cool scene here. You know, yeah, all the typical stuff that you would expect to see within the movie. And quite frankly, but I don't need to go into all the details. One thing I will say that was different in here, though, from the novel, and that I actually liked the fact that this actually differed, was that you didn't have the assassins going back and killing the king later in the story, which does happen in the novel, which I didn't like. I, I did not like that aspect of the novel at all. I thought that was just rude. And that's the two cents of Tennessee fans on that one. Anywho, skipping through the rest of the story, obviously, you know what happens. Valeria gets a snake. She dies. They set up a giant pit. There's a fight. You know, Valeria comes back from the dead, taking, obviously, everything that happened with Bellet from the Queen of the Black Coast, because that's where they lifted that from. And Conan ends up winning. 
and they cut the head off of Felsa Doom and they ride off and everybody's fine. Here's where the other fun stuff happens though in the back of the book. And this is cool because it is accompanied by a lot of really cool pictures that come from the movie. The one thing that you start off right on the bat here is an interview with the director. And this is kind of cool because I gotta tell you, this director, John Milius, and, 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 and yeah, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I know the Conan the Barbarian movie. Like I, I've seen it enough times. I've never really looked at the behind the scenes on the Conan the Barbarian movie before. Looking into this guy and what he's done, John Milius, He's done some amazing stuff. I, any of you, if you don't know, get out there and get yourself on the Google. Go, this is me pointing towards the Google. It's over there. Let's pretend the Google is in that direction. Go get yourself on the Google and look this guy up and look up his credits. Look at the things he's written and the things he's directed. It's damn impressive. This guy had a serious Rolodex when he was brought into this project. So quite frankly put, that I thought was really cool. Another thing that came out of this was this weird interplay of a story that seems to repeat throughout the, both the interviews from behind the camera and in front of the camera about the dog pack. Now, I'm not going to ruin it for you. If you want to find out, you can look it up yourself. It's a pretty interesting thing that actually happens there. The interview with actual Schwarzenegger and with... Hold on, I'm going to go back over here because I want to show you the page. I want to make sure I get the page right. There we go. And James Earl Jones. These were very cool. It was interesting listening to Schwarzenegger's own comments about what he found difficult in this and what he didn't find difficult in this. I thought that was kind of cool. But we then get to James Earl Jones over here, and hearing what he found difficult in this and didn't find difficult in this was totally different. And it's kind of funny because, you know, one of the things that relates to this dog pack story is over here, Conan and even John in his interview are talking about the dog pack and how it came around organically. But then you got James Earl Jones over here telling somewhat of a different story to it. And if you actually read into the interview, he's actually making a small insult towards Schwarzenegger over there. Now, another thing that comes out of this, and this is kind of cool, and I, I'm going to point this out right now, and it doesn't come out so much in the Schwarzenegger interview as it comes out in this one, is that the story of how busy and exactly how much interplay there was between the cast members when they weren't shooting does not entirely jive with the progression of time. What we've heard since then doesn't match this, which is kind of funny because this is written contemporaneous, whereas 40 years later, suddenly, you know, everything comes out in the wash. Kind of fun and kind of a neat thing, and it does give you both the actors and the production team's point of view of who's doing what, when, and where. The other person that was interviewed in here, which I thought was a really good one, was Ron Cobb. And I did take the time after I read this interview to go online. Again, this is me pointing to the Google. And I would encourage you to look up Ron Cobb and look at the things that he worked on. Because I always thought the sets in this were fantastic. Always have, always will. When you read the other things that he's worked on, you then understand why these were fantastic. This was a really cool put together. I gotta tell you, the novelization, comic adaptation, blah, 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 that whole thing at the front, you know, you can pick up anything and get a really cool comic story out of something. The fact that it was colored with John Buscema work and this cool watercolor, also really, really cool. But if you were to ask me, what's the key value in this book? It's right back here. It's the written word back here where they're actually talking to the team that made it. What was their motivation? How did they work together? And how did the actual production come together? This is the historical piece that I think adds value. Really cool. All right, let's get to the wrap-up. All right, it's bajillion dollar question time now. It's that point in the video where we say, well, Tennessee fans, should I go buy this thing? Well, here, here's where we're gonna go on this one, all right? We're gonna take two different tacks on this, two, okay? So if you're the Cananophile that needs to own absolutely everything Conan, and you're also that guy who also needs to know more about the original movie making, because you've run out of original Conan material that you wanna read. You wanna get deeper into those details. You wanna know what they were saying about the actual making of this movie. 40 years ago. Not through the revisionist mindset that we have now when we're looking back on it, but through the actual words that they were saying then. Well, yes, by all means, you probably want to own this book. Now, here's the thing, though. If you're not that guy, you're just one of these passing interest cananophiles. Is that a thing? Yeah, it's a thing. I've just made it a thing. You're a guy who's passively interested in the making of this movie and how it was done. You're passively interested in the story that happened within this. Maybe you just like to read the odd Conan book from time to time. Do you need to own this? Well, actually, no. And that's, that's the funny thing about this one. This is a really, really cool introspective book. It's got a really cool colorization of the story, which for most Conan readers that are into the black and white magazines, they're either going to love it or they're going to hate it. 
Personally, I thought this was kind of cool. Uh, I wouldn't say that I loved it, but I think it was kind of cool. But you have those vignettes of what's going on behind the scenes as well. This is how they made the movie. This is what the actors were saying about making the movie at that point in time. Again, kind of cool. But if you're not really interested in the filmography of it, do you need that? No, not particularly. Now, I've already made a video, and I'm going to put a link up over here. And that's where I reviewed the actual novelization of the Conan the Barbarian book. This wonderful thing that was the story of the movie. And some people love that, some people hate it, I get it. But that, I think, was a wonderful eye-opening experience that really added value when you watch the movie. Honestly, I get more value out of watching the movie now, after reading that book, than I did when I watched it originally, and I still love the movie then. Well, that's probably because I'm a Kananophile. But all things set aside, you would get more value, I think, out of reading that novel than you would out of reading this magazine adaptation. So, do you need to get it? Well, if you're the OCD, I gotta get everything guy, well, by all means, if you want to hear some of the things that are said within the interviews here, and there are some that are rather interesting, particularly one of the comments that James Earl Jones makes about whether they were hanging around on set or not, and, and, and how the cast got along, versus what we know now from what's come out from autobiographies and things written well after the fact of what was going on on set, it really changes. And that's really cool, looking backwards on that and going, Hmm, am I calling shenanigans? I know I may be calling shenanigans, I'm not entirely sure. But you don't necessarily need that unless you're really into the filmography and the filmmaking of this. So there you go, everybody. Do you need to have it? Probably not. Would you get value out of some sort of supplement to the actual movie? Well, yeah, I think the novel was actually really good and did help, but maybe not exactly this. All right, let's wrap this bad boy up and think about next video. Well, there you have it, everybody. That was a fun one for me. And I got to tell you, what was interesting is that we actually took that tack at the end of this thing. And I always ask that question of myself without any written notes. I always ask that as a, here's the real spur of the moment thing. What do we actually think? Because when you're on the spot, that's probably your honest answer without any sort of canoodling or conniving to get there. So that's why I do it that way. I didn't expect that I would come up with that conclusion, but I did, which is kind of shocking for me as a Cananophile. I actually had to say, do you really need to own this one? No, no, you actually don't. Very cool, don't get me wrong, but you don't. Now, if you are going to go buy this, I will warn you, you saw it when I showed you the magazine itself, get a better copy than mine. Okay, mine, it has lived a hard life, and I'm glad I've rescued it and given it a forever home, but, you know, you might want to find yourself a clean copy if you are that collector that wants to pick up some really close, and maybe a Niagara Con, I will actually find one of these that's in better condition, and that'll be the one that I put away, and this will be my reader copy. Because we all should have a reader copy of something we actually do want to read from time to time. Next video, so let's chat about that. Well, I tell you, here's the hope. And as a recording of this, it is pre-Niagara Comic Con. The hope is that while I'm at the con, I actually do end up picking up the last book I need for the last Robert E. Howard Battle Royale. Or the last magazine I need so we can talk about the Conan the Savage second story arc. Ooh, here's hoping. Here is hoping, and that's the direction we'll be going in with the next ones. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one. Have yourself a great day.
right, it's time to get to the video at the end of the video where we talk about the video. So, it, no, actually that's not true, okay? For those of you who don't know, this is the first time you've actually made it this far into the video. This is the little Easter eggy thing that I stick way at the ends of the video. And there's a reason why I do this. See, one of the things that I've discovered is, is, is I've lost most of you a long time ago in the video. You tuned out, I don't know, a minute, two minutes in, maybe seven minutes. But it, lately I've noticed that despite the fact that I'm sustainably making, what, half an hour, 45 minute long videos just because of the old man rambling nature that I have, people are listening more now, but still, no more than seven or eight minutes. No more. So you're gone. Like, I, honestly, it makes me actually wonder if anybody's actually hearing this stuff I'm saying now. I could be talking to nobody. And, and who knows? It, 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 that's the beautiful part about these parts because we get here and all we do is we chat. Now, hold on for a second here. I don't know what it is with my melon, but for some reason, this hat, whenever I get to this segment and I get animated, it goes, I think it's because I've got this weird egg-shaped head probably. That's probably the issue. Or almond-shaped. Could be almond. No, no, I knew a guy with an almond shaped head. Yeah, I don't have an almond shaped head. That was an almond shaped head. Okay, listen, never mind. That. And before any of you start making snippy comments and saying, hey, Tennessee Fats, what's going on with the Hyborian Age map there? Why am I seeing the. What's the. the before you make any snippy comments, I know. Okay? Uh, you see, I'll tell you what happened there. Let me tell you what happened there, and, and, and we'll buy ourselves a little bit of cred. And then we'll get into the topic that I actually wanted to chat about here at the end of the video. Okay, let's do that. All right, so here's what happened when I mounted this thing over here. So there are a variety of steps that were involved in taking this high gloss map that I bought and turning it into a matte finish map that could be sitting on a wall that's facing open, well not open, but facing windows where natural light will be hitting it all day and where I'm filming and I can't have a glare come off of it. This was an incredibly complex, it actually wasn't that complex, an incredibly uh, what would be the word to use? Involved? Yes, we'll use involved. This was an incredibly involved process. It's very simple, but it, it had to be done. So to get this to mount to the actual board, I use a spray-on adhesive. And let me tell you something that I will never do. Let's use that particular brand of spray-on adhesive again. It was horrible. It's utter crap. Because what I discovered to happen in a very short period of time is that whenever the weather got a little bit warm, or a little bit humid, or warm and humid, or stinky, or stinking humid, or stumid, as some of you might want to call it, they'd ripple. And, and that doesn't do any good when you're trying to keep something that actually looks good, flat, yet ripples. So I've been getting out the actual poster roller, the mounting roller, and I've been rolling the damn thing down. And finally it occurred to me, hey, Tennessee fans, why don't you just listen to the advice of your father, which he used to tell you all the time, which was just fix it. So I am. So in the next week or so, I'll be stripping this whole thing and remounting with the proper adhesive. And before any of you say to me, Tennessee fans, how do you know it works? Well, I already tested it over there on the fishbone poster. Now, some of you are going to say, fish, what the, if, if you know, you know, if you don't know what a fishbone is and you want to know what it, if you want to hear the story of young Tennessee fats going to his first ska concert and the ridiculous experience that came out of it, let me know. Until then, just know that it's a concert poster, okay? But I tested it on that and I know it works. So ergo, I'm assuming it'll work here. Ergo ipso facto, right? That just makes sense. So let's get back to what we actually are talking about here. And, and I'm on the squeakiest chair on the planet. This chair, for those of you who don't know, is actually a chair from my grandfather who worked with Canadian National Railway for his entire career. And this is actually a caboose chair. Now you'd probably say a caboose chair. Well, obviously you sit your caboose with, ha ha, see what it is? No, that's not actually the joke. It's a chair that you would sit on, on the platform in a caboose. You know how the caboose has that shape at the back where it's got like a roof that goes down and there's a part that's raised in the middle of it that has glass on it? Somebody would sit in that. And this is the chair that would sit up there so that they could look out the windows. And that's actually what this chair is. And I will never do this chair. I will have this chair until the day I die. And then I'll probably give it to my grandchildren. Maybe? Give it to the cats. I don't know. So somebody's going to get this chair, okay? So that's why it squeaks a lot, and you're going to have to live it. So let's get to the topic we're talking about today, okay? So this actually really speaks to the intelligence of, of our, I guess, our children, which is, I, I, I know. It, it, okay, listen, it's coming out of me and my generation, and if I'm saying it, I know most of you are already saying, what are you talking about? They're idiots. And I know most of the people my generation look at our kids, and we think that, what is the... 
every generation thinks that about the next generation. People have been thinking that since the time of the Romans, okay? We're not dead yet. The next generation is going to be just fine. But I'd say, here's a story. And this, this, this one really speaks to me. And it made me suddenly recognize that perhaps the comic medium is just slightly very broken. Slightly very broken. Slightly very broken. Okay? Here, here, here's where I'm at. Here's, here's, okay. So I'm downstairs in the basement. All right? And I'm down there and I'm wandering about. And I'm doing my thing. And my son's sitting there on his computer with his 3D printer doing his thing. And he says to me, he says, Dad. And I was like, yes. And he's like, what's the greatest comic ever? And I was like, oh, greatest comic ever. That's, that, that's, that's a toughie. Um, uh, and of course, my brain goes somewhat catatonic because little OCD in the back of my head is like, well, hold on, that question's far too big. Uh, what do you mean the greatest comic ever? Are you talking about the greatest comic story? So it, it's funny because even as your brain is thinking, like I said this out loud, for those of you who heard me, some of you have already had things popping into the front of your brain without even getting a qualifier of what the question's asking. Now, I'm not going to ask you right now what the answers are that you're coming up with, because you can tell me later. But here's what's interesting. I, so I stop and I says, well, hold on. So I start qualifying. Do you mean greatest title? Like like, 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 like Superman, Batman, Justice League, X-Men, uh, Captain America. Like, what are we talking about? Like Mouse Guard. Like, what, what are we talking about here? Or do you mean the single greatest story arc, like Kingdom Come, or The Dark Knight, or Crisis on Infinite? It was the first one, of course. There are the, uh, Days of Future Past. Uh, and there's some, there's some just genius pieces of work in here. What, what are, are we talking about that? And he stops and says, no, 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 Dad, you're, you're overthinking this. The single greatest comic, one issue. Now, at this point in time, now bear in mind, okay, I've, I've read a lot of comics, and I have the Hall of Comics downstairs. It's, it's, there's a lot of comics in the Tennessee Fats collection of the Hall of Comics. And I'm like, single issue? What does it matter with you? But, it, but again, I'm, to answer his question, single issue. And I, I stopped, and I sat in the chair, and I thought about it for about four minutes, and I finally said, okay, okay. Greatest single issue, Superman number 75. And then I sat back, because he said, well, because he was, immediately you see the look of quizzicalness, like, what the hell is Superman number 75? Like, and this is where I stepped back and said, wait, 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 wait. I'm carrying me to the comics, not bringing the comics to me. I'm carrying my own impression. And I had to say, no, no, hold on. What made Superman 75 so great was the story that led up to Superman 75. The reason why it had all the feels was because everything that led up to it made that sudden death of Superman, that issue, that single well-written masterpiece, just go, and it hit. And I was like, okay, so maybe it wasn't a single issue then. So this was what brought me to the next question then, because after that, I sat there for, I don't know, half an hour while I was wandering around, I was doing other things, or while I was just sitting down, just staring off into space, trying to think of a single greatest single issue. I can't come up with one. I honestly cannot. And, and it made me then step back and go, are we that broken? I, is something happened in comic? Maybe this has always been the case. Maybe I'm trying to infer that in the past there were single great issues that were great issues on their own. And we don't have them anymore, but I don't actually know if that was ever the case. So I'm putting it out to you guys out there. You stuck around. You, I don't know, maybe three of you. Maybe that's stretching it. If you're there, Think about this. Is there a single issue that is the greatest comic issue ever? Or are they all just the same? Is it a story arc that actually makes the single greatest issue ever? And which means that it wouldn't be a single issue, it's multiple issues. Can you only have something great when it gets to the level of it being a miniseries size? Or even two issues, like the Days of Future Past? Which, honestly, was good, but it didn't finish until you got to the 90s, when they did Days of Future Present to actually go on to the end of the story and wrap it up. And if any of you are wondering, there is a hardcover. Actually, I have the hardcover. Where is it? Yeah, it's right there. Days of Future Past. It's a whole thing. It's a collection that talks to the stuff that actually finished it off later. But I, I, I digress. Can it only be done by the time you've got multiple issues involved? I, I, honestly, I, I, I still, to this day, 
am of the opinion that the greatest comic, well, granted, I'm a Robert E. Howard channel and I read a lot of Conan and Cole, so I think I'm somewhat biased, but setting all that aside, if you were to look at everything else in the comic market, I am still of the opinion that the greatest comic ever written and the greatest story ever created and produced and sent out to production is Mouse Guard. I am still of that opinion to this day. And quite frankly, but I would love to meet the writer author this because it just, it's there. It hits. As a comic, it is just there. That is the single greatest one out there. Now, single greatest comic creator in my mind is probably Seth, which is Gregory Gallant, which is an underground comic guy that does a bunch of stuff for Drawn Quarterly. He's done, uh, what is it, Palookaville, which has been the ongoing series of work. But there's a lot, it's, there's a lot of different stories within that. But single comic for me is Nesca. I still think the Black Axe storyline is probably the best of all those. But I can't think of any single issue. I can't. I honestly cannot. So you, you out there, you, the one or maybe one half at this point in time. What's the single greatest comic issue? Can you actually have a single great issue anywhere? I don't know. I, I, I'm done thinking about it. I can't think about it. I, I've been trying. I've, it's been about a week now and I still got nothing. I got nothing. So looking for you guys some, some help here. Come on. Single greatest comic issue. One issue. And why?